Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is Virtual Conversations presented by uh, Newman University's uh, senior uh, sports manager class. All right, let's get to our panelists. Uh, let's start with Vincent. What's up, guys? My name is Vinny Santarelli. I am a graduate of Rutgers University, uh, both for my bachelor's and master's degrees. Um, I currently oversee the affiliate partnership program with uh, William Hill Sportsbook. Uh, part of the performance marketing team where we oversee all of our direct acquisition efforts. Uh, previously, I've held positions at Madison Square Garden as well as in the sports medicine sector. All right, Rocco, if you want to introduce yourself really quick. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Rocco Parika. I'm a lecturer in sport management at Coventry University in the UK. Uh, my main research areas uh, here are sport betting, and focusing more on the impact of sport betting and what that can have on grassroots development, uh, specifically focusing on revenue allocation. Uh, prior to getting into academics, I worked in professional tennis in the U.S. with the U.S. Uh, tennis Association in their player development department. Uh, hey guys, I'm, I'm Rick Gaiman. I cover golf for CBS Sports. Uh, I host their First Cut podcast and appear on their streaming network. And I run a golf data website that specializes mostly in fantasy golf and golf betting. Hey guys, I'm Anthony Garifo. I am a former student of Newman University. I graduated in 2015. I was the uh, senior seminar vice president that year. Um, so I'm very familiar with what is going on and what we are doing here. Um, and I am now a sportsbook supervisor at the Valley Forge Casino Resort. We are powered by FanDuel. Got to throw that in there. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, let's get started with our first question. So there's no sports right now. Um, what, are, what, what are we doing um, right now? So I know a lot of sports books are able to um, do the, the table tennis in different countries and everything. Um, what are you guys seeing from your perspectives? I guess I'll kick it off um, uh, since I'm working on the sports book side. It's, uh, it's been different. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the operators in the space are utilizing their iCasino platforms, uh, basically just you know mobile casino games, blackjack, roulette. Um, unfortunately, William Hill at the current moment does not offer that. So we have resorted to being a bit more creative with what we're doing and uh, the markets that we're able to offer. So we're seeing an insane amount of action on uh, table tennis. It's been really cool. And, and, you know, to see the interest level in, in sports betting uh, in the U S just because these are sports that nobody really ever pays attention to, but there is enough of an interest to invest some money into it and play a little, you know, a little action on it. So it's been really cool. Um, a few of the other crazy markets that we're seeing um, are not, they're not crazy, but they're kind of, you know, non-traditional. You're seeing Nicaraguan soccer. We're seeing, you know, Korean baseball and um, just really, again, just getting really creative with what we can offer. Um, but there is also a regulatory process that all those markets have to go through before they're approved um, by state, of course. Uh, to, to Vinny's point there, I mean, I think the interest level has not changed, right? I think people yeah. are still looking for something to wager on, to sweat, to be a part of. Uh, they're looking to be entertained and there's just, yeah, a lot of creative options out there. So whether you're seeing a lot of simulated sports, whether it's through a video game or through a, a spreadsheet of some type, you're seeing uh, official tours and leagues kind of attach themselves to that with iRacing for, for NASCAR and getting the real drivers into simulators. So everyone's getting really creative. Um, DraftKings is rolling out prize pools for the Outlaw Tour, which is a very small mini tour uh, for golf that's going on right now. And, and the prize pools are, you know, five times bigger than what the actual prizes for the golfers are getting. So it's really, really yeah. being creative and really interesting right now. I'd have to add to that also, um, I, I didn't initially say we are, we're taking bets on uh, the Cactus Tour to the golf <laughs> point. The Cactus yeah. Tour is a like semi-professional women's golf tour uh, in Arizona. So that's really cool. And then also, yeah, the eNASCAR, the video game stuff is really interesting. Um, I don't believe the regulators in New Jersey approved um, any of the like League of Legends type betting, but uh, the eNASCAR has been approved and we are taking action on that. And to kind of follow up with what Vince was saying in the beginning, 
for FanDuel slash Valley Forge, we are able to offer some of the casino play. So that for us has been, I don't want to say keeping us alive, but, you know, it's been helping our property very much with, you know, being able to kind of keep our brand, you know, on the map in PA. Um, thankfully, we are a global company. So we have, you know, pets overseas that are completely different. As been said, things need to be approved. So a lot of the markets that we offer overseas are going to, you know, there's less, less restriction. So it's kind of helping the fact that we're global. Um, and table tennis, what is it? Uh, Russian hockey, a bunch of random sports that no one watches or even knew existed are, you know, the heavy bets right now. And thankfully, I mean, for me, we, I'm out of work. Yeah. So, you know, there's a few people that in our department that are kind of, you know, keeping us, um, they're, <laughs> I lost what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> we can jump into the next question. Bob, you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, so the first question we got in the chat is, what are some of the different rules and regulations that betting companies are looking into bring esports into the mix? Yeah, like I mentioned, the esports, uh, we would love to offer it. It just has to get approved by the regulators in the state, uh, which has not been done yet. Let, let me, Vinny, so what does it take to get like a new sport? Right? Like sports books clearly don't just have the, the right to put out any bets that they want. Right? Right. Like what does that process look like? How long does it take? It's not an overnight process. Um, basically, we, we have to propose to the New Jersey Department of Gaming Enforcement our, you know, proposal, essentially what market we want to make available. And then they have their own. Um, investigatory process that I'm not even familiar with. Uh, but I know they, especially if it's overseas, they, they check to see if there's like some sort of integrity governing body overseeing it. Um, and I think that's, that's a big portion of it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an extensive process, but for the most part, we've been able to get, uh, get some of these non-traditional markets, if you will, up pretty quickly. I don't know the exact time frame again. That's that's not in, in my department. It's more of our digital operation side. Cool. And if we backtrack to football um, and getting approval done for, you know, any type of bet, uh, similar in PA where you have to get everything approved uh, for the Super Bowl, we weren't able to offer the Gatorade couple, color or, you no, know, who's, you know, anything that was not related to the game being played itself. And that seemed to always be what will – be the market offered um, yeah. if it has nothing to do with any outcome or any player. Um, and it's crazy looking for us in particular uh, during the NFL season, we're able to offer uh, most rushing yards in a season, but we weren't able to offer most sacks in a season, but the same sport, two different positions, but one was approved, one wasn't. And it's crazy to think that something, you know, so similar had such restrictions or, you know, and it differs by state. Um, which I know Vince can touch on more with New Jersey teams. Yeah, uh, specifically with college teams. Actually, uh, in New Jersey, you are not allowed to bet on any New Jersey-based college team. So Rutgers football, Rutgers basketball, Seton Hall basketball, Princeton football, hockey, whatever, you can't bet on any uh, universities that are in New Jersey um, from New Jersey. So you can cross the border into Pennsylvania and bet on Rutgers, but you can't do it in the state. Uh, it goes deep, so deep that you can't bet on Rutgers players in the NFL draft either. So we had some cool promos that we were coming up with for the draft tomorrow. And uh, basically the DGE came back and said, you need to make sure that these are carving out any sort of possibility that a Rutgers player could fall into this uh, umbrella, if you will, for this promo. So really, really interesting on that, on that end. That is interesting. Thank you for that, guys. 
Um, I wanted to pivot to Rocco. I know you're kind of on the outside of this. All these these other guys, they're they're working hands on with it, and you're kind of on a different approach. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? On just in terms of what I'm looking at specifically. Yes. Yeah, sure. So uh, basically, what I'm looking at and trying to focus on is fo using revenues from sport betting and focusing those revenues on that of sport development uh, and specifically focused on this in the U.S., knowing that in terms of the country as a whole, having sport betting becoming legalized, you know, within the last year and a half, essentially, uh, and trying to figure out ways in which the United States can look at other countries in the world as models for what they're doing with their uh, sport betting revenues. So you take something like the U.K., where I am now, and you have the National Lottery and you have essentially everybody that's going out and buying a, a lottery ticket or playing the national lottery, right? They're using portions of that, that revenue to go back into sport in the country uh, and using that certainly for elite athletes, but then uh, amateur athletes as well. Take somewhere like Norway, uh, where they have a very large lottery system and, you know, 60, 64% of that, you know, revenues that are going from their lottery system is going right back into sport development within the country. So that, that's kind of really what it's looking at it is trying to figure out ways uh, in which, you know, betting in the United States, specifically with sport, can kind of start to, to kind of outline a plan for some of those revenues and if they can be used to, to go into, you know, developing sport in the country. Because in the U.S., if you're taking elite sport, for example, right, the, the United States Olympic Committee, so those athletes that are going to represent the country in the Olympics, Right, they're essentially funding themselves or they're having private funding. It's not coming from that of the government. Uh, and so we certainly see larger sports uh, not having a problem with that. But you take, you know, the, the most recent Olympics and from the U.S. You had curling was kind of one of the bigger stories of the Olympics. Uh, and those individuals that are on the curling team, right, they are, they're paying their way essentially and, you know, trying to figure out how they can generate money, whereas some of these other countries have more governmental funding. Uh, and then you just switch to the youth sport side as well, where within youth sport in the U.S., right, parents, uh, you know, city, state, uh, and they're the ones kind of footing the bill for, for a lot of that. And there's not as much governmental oversight from a, from a federal standpoint. So when you take kind of the hype that's coming around sport betting and you have some of these projections where, you know, sport betting in the U.S. can, can kind of see revenues of three to five billion dollars uh, over the next, you know, five or so years, uh, and you're thinking, well, could some of that go to helping develop sport uh, in the country and, and really kind of in some of these areas where there's definitely some, some money that needs to be kind of going around. So that, that's, that's more or less what I've been looking at over the last uh, year or so. Hey, hey Rocco, if, if the U.S. was looking towards other countries as kind of like a, a model to, to work off of, is there a gold standard? Like you mentioned kind of the way the U.K. handles it or other countries. Is there like one specific country that would be the gold standard and, and they've been doing it long enough and they've got this all kind of figured out? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's three that essentially come to mind. Uh, the U.K. Is, is kind of one of them. Uh, and their, you know, national lottery, right, they're taking revenues from their national lottery and they're dividing it up to, to multiple outlets. Sport happens to be one of them, uh, but a lot of their focus goes toward that of, of elite athletes. Norway and, and China actually are two of the, the bigger models that have been doing this for a bit longer and, and are kind of really focusing on grassroots sport development uh, you know, Norway does a lot getting, getting kids involved in sport and they're, they're using a significant portion of their, their, their betting company to generate money back into kind of grassroots sport. Uh, and then you take China as well. They've been developing a lot uh, using a specific sports lottery designed to, to, promote, uh, to promote football in the country. So for them, you might think that there's perhaps a bit of an ulterior motive and that they want to become, you know, a football powerhouse in the world. And so why not use this revenue to just generate a ton of football academies in the country? But nonetheless, they have just kind of a separate lottery set aside uh, to, to go right back into grassroots football development in the country. So I think Norway and China are two, two pretty good examples. Uh, obviously, Norway is a much smaller country. And the United States has some intricacies in itself that makes it, you know, perhaps a little bit difficult to kind of just say, let's just mimic exactly what they're doing. Uh, 
uh, based on how the country is, is governed. But I think those are two good uh, examples you can look at. That's cool, man. Thanks. Rocco, are you seeing the, uh, or in the studies that you're doing, are you seeing that the money to fund these uh, sports development initiatives, is that coming from tax revenues that are being generated from this and from the government? Or is that coming from the teams and leagues that are charging the fees? No, so it's coming from more of a taxed type revenue. Uh, and so okay. you take like the, the Norway example. Yeah, when they're, they're essentially going in uh, to go and buy, you know, whether it's some type of a lottery ticket or however they're going about uh, betting and using the lottery system there. Yeah, there's a percentage that comes out of that that just goes right back into uh, the government. And then that money is allocated specifically towards that of, of sport. Uh, and then, you know, you take like in the UK, depending on different situations, when they have the Olympics here in 2012 in London, right, the National Lottery set up uh, a specific lottery just to raise money to help pay to host the Olympic Games. So if you were a consumer and you bought one of those lottery games, or you played one of those games, uh, then you knew that money was going directly towards the actual Olympics. Uh, and so th there's different ways in which they're going about kind of setting it up, but it's certainly, it's certainly run through that of the actual government and their kind of involvement uh, with it all. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, all that info. That's actually really interesting hearing, hearing about how that affects like youth sports and how betting money is getting fed into, into sports basically all over the world. So we have another question. Um, so Tennessee just made a large step in legalizing sports gambling, but as a first of its kind, 90% payout cap as opposed to 93 to 95%. Can any of you explain this payout cap further? And do you believe this will re be reflected in odds favoring sports books even more and turn away customers? So I saw uh, another question pop up about the hold rate and that's exactly what that is. It's a 10% hold rate which essentially means that the state gets 10% of your gross win as a sports book. Uh, we typically see it lower between, you know, five and 7%. Um, so it, it definitely cuts into what you can make as an operator there. And in some instances, in some States, it can uh, deter you from doing business there because it's, you know, hard to justify such a big cut. Um, there's other things that go into it as well, obviously, but that's more or less what the hold rate is. Vinny, when, when operators want to get set up in certain regulatory, whether it's a state, uh, isn't there like a fee and then a percentage that goes along yes. with it? So yeah. are, do we see that the, it's generally a lower fee and a higher percentage or a higher fee and a lower percentage, or can it be higher fee, higher percentage? And that's just, you know, operators have to decide whether it's worth it or not. Let's talk to our buddy in PA about that. Anthony, what can you tell me about getting into PA? <laughs> I think you're muted, bud. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it is a million dollars for the licensing alone for you to have a sports book and to operate. Um, and I'm not entirely sure of our percentages, um, but since we are outsourced, we are partnered with the casino. Um, I know the FanDuel covers the majority of the expenses that are, so basically we're kind of, we have like an insurance through them. Yeah. Um, rivals like Parks Casino, they pay out everything um, themselves. So Valley Forge, they kind of have a little bit of a bailout. I wouldn't call it a little bit, but um, majority of the money is gone through FanDuel as opposed to the casino. Yeah. I know uh, PA is extremely expensive to not only do business in, but to get into it. The upfront fee, I believe it might even be more for a digital operator. Um, yeah. Did we lose him or lose everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like it's just him. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Uh, Bob, did you want to take the next question? 
Yeah, so which sport do you guys think can see most development from the sports betting revenue? Like for, like pretty much we have four major sports in the United States, but like any sports that you guys think? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in here. I'm, I'm super biased on this. So I, I think there's two different ways to look at it. I think um, obviously in America, NFL is very likely to always be the king, right? There's just uh, so much money being wagered on it. Everybody's watching it. It's a, a great betting sport. So in terms of, of total money type deal, like I think NFL is always king. Um, the, the golf is interesting from an aspect of, uh, for the longest time, the PGA tour did not acknowledge that betting or fantasy existed, right? It's, um, you couldn't get sponsorships on guys bags. Uh, they did not have an official partner for fantasy or for uh, sports books or anything like that. So they just basically, uh, partnered with DraftKings. I don't know, six months ago, and now they're kind of rolling things out like, uh, like that. So I think golf is very much in its infancy. There's a large, a, a large area for it to grow, but NFL is kind of always going to be the king here. I agree with that. The most money we see is definitely during football season. Um, it's crazy to see how much the money fluctuates uh, between different sports um, and to see the crowds that you see. And funny enough, it might've been the same up at William Hill for Vince as well. Um, for since he's back, I saw it pop up. Um, <clears throat> for us, the beginning of the football season, crazy line out the door. Um, as the season went on, people started to drop down, and that could have been the fact that we launched our app in the middle of the season could have kind of affected those numbers. But all our revenue was through the roof. Started to fall off around baseball season, or. We opened last March, but in baseball season, the numbers are completely different. Um, in terms of most that I could see with a room for growth for development, um, I do agree with golf. I can see, you know, people don't understand when you're looking at the numbers. You're looking for the – most people look for the best odds or, you know, the obvious favorite. Um, golf, outright winners or any of the bets that you could possibly have, you can win a lot of money in golf. And they're – I don't want to say newer, but they're starting to develop more bets – for it. Um, the other sports have been more developed for a little, a little bit longer. Um, and baseball is another one. You have nine innings of play. You can bet throughout the entire game, and then you have 162 games to bet on. So I think they have great room for development. Of course, terrible timing with everything going on, but I think they can develop, not catch up to the NFL because NFL will always be king, but there's room for growth there. Yeah, yeah baseball. Sorry, sorry about that, guys. My my internet cut out for a second. Um, but uh, I agree on the baseball point. I think as MLB brings in um, their own version of sports betting partnerships, uh, you'll see the interest in that jump even more. Uh, but you're 100 percent right about the 162 game season. If you get somebody as a sports better in baseball for the first game, you're likely to have them for most of the season. Uh, however, as you can tell by the poster behind me, um, I am all on board for the golf betting. I think it's going to be huge. Um, I've, I personally engineered a partnership with Golf Digest to make sure that we were a step ahead of everything um, when it comes to getting golf betting content out there. And shout out to Stephen Hennessy, who is the golf betting editor. He's an awesome dude, um, writes great content. And, uh, you know, we, we launched our partnership with the – 17th hole at TPC Sawgrass in the Players' Championship, which is by far the most iconic par three, maybe next to uh, 11 or 12 at Augusta, whatever, whichever one that is. But um, the Island Green. So basically, we came up with a promo where if you're, you selected a better to win, or sorry, if you selected a golfer to win the tournament outright, and at any point during the tournament, he hit a hole-in-one on that 17th hole. So he has four, tra four tries if he makes the cut. Uh, then you win $1,000 on top of whatever your winnings are. But you would also, you know, you would get that money. You would get the $1,000 even if he didn't win the tournament. So it's a really cool promo that we were doing. Um, and Golf Digest just wrote an article on it, and we were able to kind of activate through that. So I'm all on board. Uh, so are my friends from Action Network. I had lunch with them just before everything kind of went to hiatus. They all came over from the city uh, into Jersey. Uh, they can't bet from the city. So as soon as they crossed the border, they were putting in all their golf bets while we were sitting at lunch. So 
it was really cool. I think that there is tremendous room for growth in golf. I think the appetite is there as we, especially as we start to see the demographic of uh, American men and women to a certain extent, uh, the age drop in interest for golf. So traditionally it was like an old guy sport, but now we're seeing like really that 21 to 35 uh, just boost in golf interest. And, and I love that. Music to my ears. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Same. We got to, uh, we got to get a, a round on the books together Let's once, uh, once life is normal again. <laughs> Love it. Thank you guys. Um, another question. Uh, what are your thoughts about sports teams in the U S offering uh, sports betting in stadium? And do you think you'll be able to uh, bet on the home teams? Uh, I'll, I'll take this from kind of like the fan side of it and let the other guys take it from the other side. I mean, listen, that's the natural progression, right? I mean, there's some NBA, NHL, NFL teams that get, I guess, close to this with, I mean, it's not really betting on it, but like the 50, 50 raffle, like in stadium, you're, they've got the, they've got the booths. You can go put some money down and, and they get some pretty big pools. Um, the opportunity to make bets on, yeah, score for this quarter or score for this half in the arena, I think is the natural progression of where all of this is headed. Now there will be a lot of regulatory stuff around. Yeah. Betting on the home team. I imagine if you can't bet on the home team, you probably shouldn't do this. Um, but I, that's, that's for the lawmakers and everybody else to decide as a fan. This is where we're, this is where we're headed. I wouldn't see it being too much of a problem as being able to build a home team. I mean, whether you're doing it in the stadium or out of the stadium, you're still, as long as you're obviously not a player. Um, I can't see that being too much of an issue. Um, you're starting to see restaurants. I know Buffalo Wild Wings is a partnership. I forget what book it is, but they are able to start offering sports betting kiosks in their restaurants. Um, again, can't tell you the states that regulated that, but I know they have that partnership, and it's only a matter of time. I mean, um, what is it, live? The live casino opening down in Philadelphia, opening right next to every single Philadelphia sports venue. So we're literally on the doorstep. So it's only a matter of time it progresses there, especially if they're starting to display odds for games. You're starting to see sponsorships from sports, uh, I guess, authorities or sports books. Um, with teams. So that has to be the next step. Yeah, it's a state by state decision. And it's really, it's really tough. Um, there's a lot that goes into to making that decision. Uh, back in October, you know, we actually announced that we are going to be the first sports book to have a sports book in an arena. <laughs> uh, and that's going to be down in Washington, DC, Capital One Arena. Um, so that, you know, I don't, I can't really release too much about it, but uh, you know, that's going to be a really, really cool idea. Really, really big game changer for us. Um, you know, is that ever going to happen in New Jersey or other markets? You would hope so. Um, you know, it ha it, it's, it's been in effect overseas. I'm pretty sure. And maybe Rocco, you can touch on that for forever. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be the natural progression, but, I think we're a ways away from seeing it widespread. Just say it had to happen. All right. Did, did we lose Rocco? Yeah, no, sorry. I was oh. lost and I just came back in. So I came in at the tail end and I heard you mention me, but I wasn't entirely sure what the question yeah, was. Yeah, no, well, we were just, we were touching on um, how, you know, we would like to see sports books open in arenas uh, and, and, you know, William Hill is going to have the, their sports book, our sports book in Washington, DC, where the wizards and the capitals play. Um, are you, or can you touch on what it's like in Europe and how there is that option to bet inside the arenas there? Yeah, there, there is, I mean, England's an interesting one. Uh, and I didn't know this until I moved here. Uh, but I always find it kind of kind of funny that so to go watch a Premier League match, you actually can't drink alcohol in the stadium and you're not allowed to see the pitch uh, if you're consuming an alcoholic beverage, uh, but you are allowed to place bets in the stadium. 
which I always just thought was kind of interesting uh, coming from the U.S. where obviously uh, you are able to drink alcohol while watching uh, sporting events, but there certainly is not betting going on during them. Uh, so I do think if we're looking at it from a U.S. perspective that that would kind of make sense as to where a progression would go is that once the leagues kind of came on board with figuring out a way to, to do this, uh, that there would be the opportunity to, to place, you know, bets during games while they're going on, uh, you know, for just the convenience of the consumer, but also from an engagement standpoint. And, you know, we started to see until, uh, you know, this coronavirus with the XFL and them having, you know, the on-screen over-under betting lines, you know, during TV broadcasts. And that was kind of starting to show a glimpse perhaps of the future of, of betting for sports within the U.S. And kind of thinking that if that started to get more people engaged and involved with watching XFL games and perhaps thinking about figuring out a way to, to place a bet, that it seems like, well, if that went well, that in the future they'd be trying to figure out how to get it into uh, into stadiums to be able to do it. Um, I know here one of the concerns with that is is certainly gambling addiction uh, and that with you know kids that are going to, to games and kind of being very normalized to the idea of of betting on sports and thinking that it essentially is a part of the game uh, whereas you know in the U.S. that, that certainly isn't a concern yet because you're growing up knowing that it's not a part of it. And if anything, you, you might view it more, you know, more negatively, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely prevalent here for sure. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll move on to our next question in queue. This one's directed at Rick, but I think everyone can, uh, can answer this. You have a friend out there, Rick, Evan. Um, he wants to know, uh, do you think that, if this pandemic goes on for a while, the first sport back will be golf, like 1v1 competitions that could be streamed and give fans the choice to bet. Yeah, so uh, I think it's logical that golf comes back first uh, or one of the first. I mean, quite, quite frankly, they were the last to, to shut it down. I think they probably only shut it down because of the pressure of all every other sports organization shutting down. And it's a bad look if you keep going. Um, but they have a little bit of a foot to stand on and say, OK, well, we're an outdoor sport that's played over many acres. Uh, our competitors do not have to touch each other. They don't have they're not sweating on each other. They're not doing anything like that. Um, you can get away with uh, very few people out there. Like w when golf comes back, and, and I think when a lot of sports come back, co sports come back, it'll be without fans, right, for probably a long time. And golf is uh, very easily played without the fans. You'd probably have less than, I don't know, 500 people with staff and players and caddies and everything like that. So it, it's logical that it is one of the first sports back. And uh, as of right now, they're targeting June 8th. June 8th to come back is the date on the PGA Tour calendar that is still uh, going as planned. So we'll, we'll find out soon. Interesting uh, hearing that they're still sticking with that plan with everything going on right now. So another, we have actually another question regarding, I guess, co with COVID-19. So the website Sports Handle projects sportsbooks lost an estimated $973.5 million dollars and legal wagering from the cancellation of March Madness. So what does that look like in terms of growth for sports betting, both present and post COVID-19? I think the appetite for betting is still there. That, that, hasn't, that hasn't dwindled at all. Um, that's why we've gotten creative with what we can offer. Um, you know, that said, we, like many of our, um, like many of our competitors have kind of paused or, you know, really scaled back our spending on media. So you're not seeing as much advertisement in the, in the space. And that's, you know, both to be smart financially and being sensitive to the situation, you know, people losing jobs, we don't want to necessarily push them to spend their money on sports betting. You know, it's just being insensitive at that point. Um, so there has definitely been like a tone change. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're all waiting for it to come back, man. It's, uh, it's uh, it, from, a, from a fan perspective and from being in the business, like anyone who works in sports right now is really being affected by this. It's, it's really top to bottom. Um, 
you know, we all kind of enter this field with, you know, wide eyes and a, and a bright smile because we really are so excited to work in sports. And then something like this happens, you know, and, and we're kind of all put on hold. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really my take on, on it. Vin, Vinny, like, okay, so I understand there's not a lot of sports going on. And I understand yeah. that people might not have the discretionary income to make wagers, which they might have done in the past. But does a time like this kind of really accelerate mobile betting? You know what I mean? Not having to yeah. walk up to a window and actually place a bet, but being able to do it from my phone on my couch. Yes. That's, that's where all of the bets are coming from. Yeah. You know, um, obviously all of our casinos are closed. All of our retail locations are closed. So there's no, there's no real like other component to it than just being just able cool. to bet from your phone. And, and it's really, you know, it's really the saving grace for, for all of the operators. Got it. Yeah. For us in particular, and I'm sure I've seen other competitors doing, I'm sure William Hill's doing it as well. Thankfully, right now we're able to offer future bets. You have the NFL draft tomorrow. So, and then as we touched on before, table tennis and all the other sports no one ever thought of betting on um, that are helping. Um, but I mean, I guess from a growth standpoint, all you can do is go up. And it just said my internet cut out. I hope everyone heard that. <laughs> we got you. <laughs> cool. All right. We'll move on to our next question. Um, so we talked about the younger generation uh, for golf specifically. Uh, many people in the in generation um, say that golf is boring, but does that the gambling bring in the extra sense of excitement? uh i'll argue golf's not boring um yeah. <laughs> throw that out there but no i mean listen we we kind of touched on it for just a brief second earlier it is the it's the best sport to bet on um football is awesome but you get it once a week you get golf once a week too but um and i think anthony had mentioned outright bets if you're betting a golfer to win the tournament and you're betting him at 50 to 1 100 to 1 150 to 1 golf is the only sport that you're going to be able to get those odds and get that bet turned around from Thursday to Sunday. If you have any, think of any other bet out there that's 100 to 1, 150 to 1. It's probably a future, it's probably like the Vegas Golden Knights to win the NHL, to win the Stanley Cup. And, and you're talking about six months of having your money tied up as opposed to four days of having your money tied up in a golf tournament and still getting a similar payout. So right there, that's unique to golf. And then you throw in on Friday when half the field gets cut and the golfer that you bet on is um, like on the cut line and he needs to make a putt on 18. It becomes a very exciting sport. So uh, I will make, I will, I will make that argument. I'm not a better at all. Uh, I don't bet, you know, I rarely, rarely bet. My claim to fame with betting was, my $2 bet on Tiger to win the Masters last year, and I turned it into 50 bucks. So that's, that's really the extent of it. But, you know, think of all the excitement that was around Tiger at that point. And now I've got a little, I've got a little change on that, too. If he wins, I'm going to be, you know, $50 richer. Love it. Not that it's that, you know, <laughs> whatever. You, you get the point, you know? Yeah. The bigger events are definitely a bigger draw. And people that don't necessarily – care about the sport they hear a name yeah, let me throw 10 bucks on there because as rick said the odds the odds will always be a drawing factor and as we continue to grow uh the sportsbook industry that's people are going to start to look for more to bet on um i have a regular that every time he was in He's trying to find something else, and he was in his twenties, and that's what. You know, so that generation, they're not just looking for, you know, they're looking for more. They're trying to turn their money into a quick profit. We'll say. Awesome. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our next uh, talking point. So. Um, it really revolves around um, consumer engagement through sports betting. Um, we, we have um, like the XFL just, uh, well, what their season was. They had the, the money lines um, on their scoreboards and everything like that. What 
is there future um ideas like this that are going to be brought up like how um do companies use uh, consumer engagement um through their their live sports and sports betting yeah i mean rocco alluded to this earlier um i think the united states itself is is kind of in the infancy of a lot of this we're still trying to figure it out um and education is a big part of it so if you if you throw out a money line or odds on screen for a lot of these sports and we're talking about like my dad watching right who's 60 whatever watches sports like does he know what those odds mean does he know what a minus 150 money line is uh, and then you need to start in integrating it into that that mainstream broadcast uh, educating these people what those odds actually are, uh, what percentage of the time. I mean, pe people have a, a, dif a difficult enough time wrapping their head around probabilities and things like that as it is. Um, so there is an educational process that we are going to have to go through as a society, as a sport watching society to learn all of this and then convert people who are just casual viewers, my dad, for example, into placing a bet on a William Hill mobile app or something like that. Yeah, and again, I, is, I don't know how much I can actually share about it, but we've... Share it uh, all. Tell us everything. I, well, <laughs> you're in on it, man. You work for CBS. <laughs> so so uh, we, we announced a few months ago that we are, you know, set to be the official uh, sports betting partner of CBS Sports. So over the next few months, uh, you know, even into 2021, we'll be really ramping up our integrations into CBS sports. So you're going to see William Hill um, all over the fantasy products, um, all over um, the, hopefully the broadcasts as well. Um, and, you know, into the future, maybe you will see that into the mainstream sports where you're, where you're finding, you know, the active and, and the live odds and lines already, you know, right baked into the broadcast. So um, really interesting time. Um, I think, you know, we're really going to try to be trendsetters in terms of what we're doing with CBS Sports. Uh, so keep your eye out because we have some really cool things coming up. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Anthony, I know that um, from your time uh, with Valley Forge, uh, you talked about like the behind the scenes kind of thing. So um, basically handling the sports book uh, type of um, make sure that like in-house people don't um, like, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, Do anything illegal. Yes, yes. Uh, could you touch on that a little more for uh, everyone? So, so the state and actually every state has their own set of regulations. Um, PA, it varies by sports book. Um, I actually work at two different sports book. One as a supervisor, another as a sports book teller, taking the bets basically. Um, and both of them have different rules. Both the thing that stays consistent is reaching a ten thousand dollar threshold. With a ten thousand dollar threshold, if you reach it, you are required to give your social. They basically do a full background check on you. Make sure you are who you say you are. And, you know, they're trying to protect the people, well, protect us, protect the people that come there, protect everyone, really. Um, money laundering, if anyone is familiar with the show Ozark, or Ozark, um, it is very real. Casinos are the number one place that are used to rotate and clean dirty money. So that's being on the front lines, that is what our job entails, is making sure that the people come in, they're just placing a sports wager. They're not trying to do anything shady or, you know, bringing harm to anybody. And Don't give anything away, Anthony. I just started Ozark. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, what's funny is when I watched it, I kept saying casino, casino, and 
Well, not to give it away, but because you know. <laughs> Bob, do you want to handle our next question? Yes. Yeah, so the one of the point you, I would like you guys to talk about is like, again, like how average better is evolving into like quick betting, such as like quarter, like every quarter, every half, and all that. So just wanted you guys to talk about like how what does that actually mean? Like what does it mean by quick betting? Uh, there's there's different names for it. Uh, in play is a, is a popular one that we use um, basically as the game goes on the lines change um, historically it's been like a outright bet like a straight bet beforehand before the game starts but uh, we've seen a lot of popularity in the in play a lot of people prefer that um, the in play with the table tennis right now is insane um, I, yeah, that's <laughs> the in play with the table tennis is insane. Is this did I ever I did I ever I think <laughs> yeah did I ever think I'd say that like series of words in succession? No, but um, yeah, it's it is that's and that's kind of what people are almost leaning towards now. I mean, obviously you can you know you can still win, but it's going to be a significantly lower payout uh, than if you would have placed that same bet before the game started. It's, it's really a win-win, right? The consumer wants something that they can get instant gratification on. If, if I can yeah. make a bet for, hey, what the third quarter score is going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to find out what the results of that are in 15 or 20 minutes. And some things a lot quicker than that. Uh, and at the same time, books are able to turn over bets more often. If you win a, a bet on the first quarter and I win, like, sure as heck, I'm going to bet something on the second quarter or the third quarter. Like I'm going to, I'm going to keep it going. It's kind of a win-win situation. Uh, but a lot of it depends on now where we're at with the data. Uh, data needs to come through quickly. It needs to come in real time. Um, in, in golf's world, you know, you can bet on a single round of golf um, for major events, for large events. Sometimes you can bet on, hey, is Tiger Woods going to make a par, a birdie, a bogey on this hole? Um, I think you'll see a lot more of that as the data gets quicker. We're getting it in real time and books are able to offer these bets as, as quickly as they can. You can bet on things as crazy as the next hit. Or will the next player get a hit? Um, will the next hole be a birdie in golf? So there's just any market that they could potentially put out to, as you said, quickly turn over the money into another bet. Uh, they're going to put it out there. All right. Touching off of a lot of points that were already brought up, um, we're talking about the the table tennis is just uh, exploding. Um, people are betting on that. Now, once sports actually do come back, does that go away? What do you guys think? Like, do these these new um, sports or that you can bet on that are popular now are they going to die once once actual sports are back, or do you think that they have a whole new market for this? It's kind of hard to say. You never, you never know. Yeah. You know, it could, it could be carving out a whole, a whole new thing. Um, but I do believe that once we have all of our sports back, that the, obviously the focus is going to be on that. Yeah. It's, it's appetite, right? And you don't, you don't yeah. have to bet table tennis if uh, football's back or, or whatever. Right. I, I think, I think it's awareness for a lot of these leagues. Like I, I did not know a lot of this stuff existed. Now I do. I think it's good. Um, to, to think that people will continue to bet on it at the rate they're betting on it now is probably very, very optimistic. I also feel like a lot of people bet based on where they're hot at. Now, I don't know if people are necessarily getting hot at table tennis, but if they're seeing success in betting table tennis, that might be something they consider to continue doing. Um, I can say I kind of went on a hot streak with table tennis <laughs> during this whole thing. And, you know, I might look into it if I start to do a bit in baseball. But as it said, you never know until, you know, all the other sports are back and it's not something you can really predict. Mm -hmm. 
So we have actually another question from our audience that uh, just popped up. So this is going back to the lot, like the betting lines going on the TV broadcast. So going off the topic of CBS and betting lines on the screen during games, could we potentially see channels like CBS or similar, similar companies like ESPN and Fox create additional streaming channels that show all the bets on the side of a screen for any or all games? I believe this was done at the past year's Super Bowl. Yeah. This, this, we actually talked about this last week uh, when we got together. And, yes, this, this happens. I think it will continue to happen. I don't know if it's right or wrong, though. I think that um, you're not really expanding into the main market if you do this. You, you throw up a sports betting channel, a sports betting stream. I'll watch it because I'm interested in that. But you're not getting my dad. You're not getting the casual fan. They're still insulated in their own little world. So, yes, I think it will happen. Uh, but when we've reached like full critical mass is when all of that is part of the main broadcast. Agreed. I think um, it's tough. You know, I, I don't know if there will be a separate channel for it, but I think that, that you will start to see more of those integrations um, come live in the live broadcast. What I think is probably more realistic is, um, and I guess some sports kind of do this, but Mimicking, mimicking red zone um, for other sports mm -hmm. where you That's can kind of just, you can bounce around um, and the way that you don't necessarily frame it as this is the sports betting channel. It's like, this is like the action. Like you're just going to see all the biggest plays or all of the most interesting storylines. We're going to bounce you around all over the place. Then, then people can use it for their own fantasy, for their own betting, for whatever else. It, it would be a very narrow niche stream or channel to probably just focus on strictly people who are betting this game. All right. Um, so I know as of right now, FanDuel does not have um, the NFL draft. Um, I know a lot of offsite um, like websites are doing that and stuff. Um, for this year's draft, do you uh, foresee that, like the type of bets, like who's going to go number one, all those sort of things, do we see that being an option for, for future drafts when sports are all back and everything and these sites can get all that up? Do you think that's a possibility? Um, I, it is It is a possibility. It, it's happening. We're, we're live with that. Like that's okay. this is considered a, a tentpole event for us really since – there's nothing else to bet on right now. So yeah, I believe across all the operators, we are offering uh, NFL draft props um, and futures. So there, yeah, this is, this is a big, a big, big event for us tomorrow. Are there any complications that go in with the schools? I remember last time we maybe had a chat, you mentioned like something about if a school, if a player from like Rutgers or a school from like New Jersey, sometimes there's like different restrictions on yeah. depending where a player is from even. So do you want elaborating maybe on some of the restrictions? Yeah, the, well, it's, it, again, it's a state by state thing. So in New Jersey, you're not allowed to bet on, the, on any college teams or players. So um, if a Rutgers player fell into a prop bet, then that would be nullified. Um you can't you can't offer that. It's considered a violation. So, uh, yes, that's it's a direct impact. Thankfully, we don't have those laws and regulations in PA. You can bet on any game. Right. All right. We have one more question from the audience, and then that that's going to be it. Um, the question is, do you think odds will be affected if sports are played with no fans? Um, so you obviously got to take into consideration like hometown, uh, home crowd and everything like that. Do you think that changes when sports come back? Maybe slightly. I don't think it'll have an overwhelming effect. Um, actually, the uh, I think they started Korean baseball yesterday and – the, we had a we had a call this morning with uh, some of our our marketing team and um, it was brought up like how amped up the players were like the stands were empty but the, they were just so happy to be playing again that they were jacked up and uh, I think you know that in itself might balance out not having the home team or the home crowd there because these guys want to get out just as much as we want them to come back like they want to play these guys are competitors and and they want to do what they love and 
they want to make their money too. You know, there's, there's certain, and I was, I don't know if you guys are, anybody on this listens to spit and chicklets at all, but I was listening to uh, the, you know, the Barstool Hockey Podcast and I was listening to uh, Kevin Hayes and Keith Yandel were on like a few weeks ago and I was listening to them talk about them wanting to come back. Yes. Cause they love hockey and, and they want to play in front of their fans or just play in general, but there's, there's portions of their CBA built out where if they don't hit a certain amount of, um, a certain amount of regular season games, then they, they like lose a lot of their rev share. So it, there's a lot that goes into this that we as fans and, and people on the outside of the industry don't even know. Um, so yeah, there's that, there's that aspect of it also. 